question today is what would it be what how would we phrase this what would a beginner use for jewelry making or what's a good jewelry uh, beginning jewelry making kit who wants to go first you should rest your mouth for a minute let's make amber talk she's over there really quiet that what oh. wait, what's the what am i talking about <laughs> Been so long. Question. So, if you were starting over again as a jeweler, what would you buy for your tools? Okay, um, I would get a jeweler saw. I would get a bench block. I would get. Wait, when do? What do you mean by a bench block? A bench block oh, is a piece out. of metal, um, steel usually that you can um, hammer metal flat that you've warped and stuff like that and bent and make um done and oh bent yeah. like inch like, anvil or whatever yeah, yeah like a mini anvil anvil and a bench pin would be good oh yeah but it gets out and then you can you have a workspace to cut and whatnot i think also the people have to learn, and I want to do a video on this, is um, on a bench pin, having it customized for what you're doing. Like I've got grooves to hold wire going across and those little V's so I can saw tiny little pieces out instead of just the big V. And there's all kinds of different adaptations. So that's definitely a bench pin, but an adapted bench pin. I've seen those too. There are quite a few. That yeah. Are, they're expensive. I like that one that I have from, um, What's his name? Tom oh, Man. Thomas Man. Uh, Tom Man. <laughs> Tom Man. <laughs> John Boy. <laughs> yeah, he. Uh, Studio Flux. That, right. Yeah, I like. I like that. Flux art. I think it's called Studio Flux. Hmm. It is. Oh, one of the one of the things that I see nowadays is a. Uh, a lot of very expensive bench pins. Yeah. And. You don't you, need to. the K and E W, uh, they have one or uh, something. Concepts or whatever. Okay. okay, so I would I would say a couple of files. I the my favorite I think is the um, half round file because it has the curved that. and the flat, mm -hmm. yeah. and I think that would be good for a lot of projects. And having like a goldsmith hammer with a polished head, so then you don't have to worry about figuring that out. Now, do you like the domed or the flat? I like the slightly domed, not severely domed. I, I'm with you on that. And we also finish the edges on our hammers with sandpaper and polishing compound to make them not cut. As yeah. As, yeah. So, and what else? Right. And let's see what else. Um, uh, I'd say a mallet of some sort. I'm yeah. reading. I wrote it down actually. So. Oh, good. And then uh, woman. I should oh. be running and doing show and tell. Every time she says something, I should just grab it from my bench and show it. There you go. Go for yeah. it. Yeah. And then um, yes, the rawhide mallet. mallet. They come in different sizes. You could get. I'd say a smaller one, not the smallest, but not the biggest uh, either. Let's say um, the chasing hammer. You have a chasing hammer handy over there, madam. Because you could oh, use that. Call her Vanna. Vanna triplet, what, whatever the rest no, of That's it. a fancy one. That's Fret's tools. That's a Fret's. Hey, let me show you what it makes. <laughs> oh, Fret's I makes um, the economy line, though, and they come finished. So that's really cool. Are you chasing her? hammer running? Huh? Are you chasing hammer running? Yeah. <laughs> um, and well, then, the only I only I don't have too many hammers actually. Let me show you, you the have, ones I got. You have a really awesome one. And then I say, um, oh yeah, that's needle beautiful. nose pliers or a half. Oh yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, Chain yeah. nose are probably one of my favorites. Really? And but I mean, you, someone can get by with flat ones too, like just that's, flat. That's my favorite. Yeah. Flat pliers in various widths. You know, I've got some that have been filed down so that it just leaves this little center strip and it's not all the way out to the edge so that it's tiny. Uh, oh, look at those. I would call those worthless in my opinion. I actually use them really often for bezels. Isn't that ridiculous? They are They're so, so tiny. Tiny. <laughs> is, 
Did you get those from your uh, your gnome instructor? Uh, I actually <laughs> bought those that after that, that class thought, when I was maybe in the dorm room and I didn't have room for full size tools. <laughs> like, yeah. There you go. Those. Yeah. There you go. Parallel jaws. Yeah. Okay. I got that. I love those things. I um, honestly lack a little bit in the plier. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Oh, I don't have any like that. You can make them. And then I love, I love Wubbers. Wubbers mm -hmm. make the great big square ones. The big yeah, ones. And these are my other favorite little. So, you know, the range of. Yeah. Well, my husband looks at the 40 odd pliers I have and always says, why do you need so many pliers? And it's like, I use them all, all the time. Yeah. Most I'll have a job. I think I have probably about 30 pliers. Yeah. Yeah, Clive's close. I'm not in the shop today because it's still cold outside, but um, yeah, I'm not going to do a show and tell so much, but uh, same same thing. I've got an entire, you know, those uh, cobalt toolboxes with the pull-out drawers? Yeah. Yeah, I've got one of those entire drawers that's jam-packed of pliers. So for beginners, I think what, you, what we say here is so we'll start with like, what Amber said, maybe, or I, I think you should have a one flat plier in your nest, and then round nose and and the chain nose. I think if you had three pliers, those were the three that I would. Yeah, that have. I could. Yeah, I was just kind of. No, no. I mean, you all. We all have different opinions on this. This is my opinion on it. Is mm -hmm. that I would say if you're going to start, I if I was going to start, I would have a really good pair of round nose pliers like Swanstrom. Spend the money because they have to meet perfectly at the end and you want them real thin at least in the beginning because you'll get various different thicknesses and heights of, of round nose but i like a really tiny point so you can make little tiny loops uh and and they should they should meet perfectly so a lot of these cheap ones from pakistan uh, don't meet in the middle um they're rough around the edges the tips are all cut off so, yeah, they they're almost worthless. Them. So, you know, sometimes it's worth saving. You know, put ten bucks a month away to buy a sixty pair, dollar pair of set of pliers. So, absolutely, I I love. Them. So, Amber, were you done? You still had a list. Um. Wait, let me pull this. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> uh, let's see. I put. I like after the basic basic. I thought in the other land doing getting like a flex shaft. Yeah. Um. Needle files as some kind of measuring tool. Yeah, with and, millimeters and centimeters. Yeah, and uh, I mean gauge wheels are good, but if you have a like an S gauge for the United States people. Yeah. Right? Yeah, and, and uh, it says B and S on it because there are other gauges out there, and you're gonna, it's gonna really mess you up because there are different measurement systems. So, just true that. That. I'm supposed to go through that. Yeah. <laughs> that, and then some kind of soldering surface like a charcoal block or um, maybe we should break like this up into what you would get for a soldering setup as opposed to just a jewelry tool setup mm -hmm. you know, because yeah. it's such a different different set of so many options this one seemed better days right like a solderite board yeah yeah my favorite is the round char hard char i never buy the soft charcoal unless i'm going to push things into it rio sounds sells a round one that one right there i love yeah. that round one i love this thing i just got that a few months ago and i've used the crap out of it and i use the turntable all the time but it's a yeah. ceramic turntable it's a decorating table metal I have a, a kneeling pan. I actually, it's like back, right, right, right there. Yeah, yeah, right there. And, uh, the pumice in it. Yeah, and so it helps. And then you could use it as a razor and then to ri riser. Right. And then uh, spin it. So and I people like can also use like ceramic brick or kiln brick. To That's what I use. On. Yeah. I use a kiln brick in my uh, pumice round. Oh, okay. So it pulls it up and it has like more Thanks, Anna. thank you <laughs> I, I like using use a kiln shelf yeah because uh, i feel like uh, i got a huge one for my surface so you know it's fire safe and stuff like that it's flat and it's, it's pretty it's pretty big 
I the don't thing know. about the, so the soldering surfaces is they kind of retain heat slightly differently. So it may, I mean, honestly, I've never really noticed that big of a difference. Um, the one thing I did like about charcoal is I can carve it if I wanted to do round balls by melting jump rings, because otherwise mm -hmm. they have a flat bottom. Um, so I can carve and I have a secondary charcoal for making channels in. You can also pour ingots in uh, charcoal if you carve it. And so, the, you know, the soft charcoal, you can push pins into it to hold. Yeah, it. that's the first sweat soldering. I like having a real soft one, like, solderite or something yeah so you can push the yeah. <laughs> there you go. that's what they look like if you quench those with spray bottle every time you use them you won't have as many holes like that by, by the way yeah i didn't treat that one very nicely and it literally i at least did like the binding wire thing to it right but it definitely broke into like three parts and that's when i bought the nice hardened one that's like so i was like yeah. maybe this will do better and then i read that you're supposed to quench it Big difference between the hard and soft charcoals, for yes. sure. Uh, <laughs> I agree with you. And the quenching, I swear, extends the life because, it, you know, for those of you out there that don't know, if charcoal is just like the stuff that you put in your fire, what are they called? Bar barbecue thing. Barbecue, what's it called? Barbecue thing. Yeah, briquette. Charcoal. Well, that word I have, I didn't know the thing that you put them in. Anyway. Barbecue. If you light it on fire, <laughs> it continues to burn until it's ash, right? So the same thing's happening with your charcoal block. If you're, especially if you're doing a lot of soldering, and that thing's really hot, and you don't know if it's still burning down inside. So yeah. I always recommend quenching it so that it doesn't ash out on you. Yeah, uh, that's a new thing, ashing out. So mm -hmm. keep like a spray bottle, a spray yeah. bottle right there to get it out. It looks like a method spray bottle to me. Uh, you are a wise woman. <laughs> I have several of them myself. Works great. I love them. They're so high quality. They like never break. I wanted your uh, guys' opinion. I don't even know if this is going to work, but, uh, so I moved my studio for film purposes, uh, telling everyone that I moved my studio in my, uh, spare room and I've tried to keep it as fire safe as possible, but I'm trying to do this ventilation thing here and yeah. that goes out my window. I cut a piece of wood with a hole in it, but is that too high? I mean, do you think the fan? Yeah. Is the it's really going to pull. It's going to pull fumes. Yeah, it's not ideal. Ideal should be behind your work. So yeah. away. you don't want stuff going up over your face. Yeah, it is recessed back, but um, well, why don't you try it? Do something, do it, like burn some paper. That's what I always uh -huh. do to check and get it real, like newspaper, it's great. You roll it up and then just light it on fire. And it's only hooked up with um, C-clamps, so I can easily. Well, it's I think, better than the other day, you just had one screw. <laughs> I know. She's upgrading slowly. I might bolt it to the frame of my window, but I didn't really want to do that. Well, what if you bolted it to the back of your bench there? Like, th what she's using here is an inline fan uh, that that are pretty inexpensive. What are they about thirty five bucks, something like that, Amber? Yeah, it was a little cheap. Huh? It has the the speed ratio thing. I think yeah, it was it's on a speed control on it, and, and it's mounted backwards, so it pushes air out. Yeah. Yep. Now, but, one thing that I've seen uh, folks do is take something similar to that only create a shroud around it with like plastic or cardboard and then create a tube so everything that's pulled into there is going to be directed out and then down below where you have uh, a lot of your fumes coming out they make the opening wider so all the air is pulled into that and then out the window yeah and he's like one makes of sense. the dryer vent um like that kind of yeah. like oil looking tubing or whatever right yeah. oh i said i have to get something like that set up here too i actually have really good ventilation in our garage because our large garage door doesn't seal well and so i can have the door open and then i wear a mask and then i have windows and stuff but i want i want and need that's like something that's high up on my list that's is good. something like at least like what amber's doing or to buy one of those desktop um fume extractors but yeah um, yeah there's so, one that's no good the cheap one is no good 
I've heard it's horrible. Like the yeah. T25 on Amazon that's that just says it's expensive. like a desktop fume extractor is supposed to be pretty horrible. There's, there's a really expensive one that works really well. Um, I used to do, and this was just for sucking up when I was filing and sanding, is a shop vac with a vent to suck all the fines from filing and sanding and stuff. Uh, but I just got to the point where I couldn't handle the uh, the whole time. You know? I was like, stop, go away. The whole desk is shaking. And, yeah. yeah, that kind of stuff. I think it's just a mask is the best with N95 particulate mask. If there are any left out there, 3M, please make more. I have a, I have a P100 as well. Oh. Yeah, yes, I, I use those. Nice. Or I have an entire gas mask that I can put on over my head. Um, I'll use I'll use that. that when I work in steel, like on my yeah. uh, belt grinder when I'm grinding on knives and stuff. I don't want steel particulars. Idea. No, and they can get in your eyes and embed in your eyes. People don't even know that. I've had heard of jewelers going to the doctors and they have rust rings. You you will have rust rings. Yeah, I ha I was awake during the procedure to remove it. Oh yeah. Like you're watching this thing come toward your eye. And then I go had, into your eye. I had cataract surgery and I was wide awake. So I, read, I know what you do. Oh, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh. Yeah. Good thing that they, well, they make you, at least my doctor gave me happy pills mm. before. So it's like, oh, ah. Oh. <laughs> so anyway, one of the things is you really have to have ventilation people. There's uh, some kind, even if it's just like one of those fans that sucks or blows out, you can put it so that the air gets sucked out your window. Um, you preferably want to have it slightly beho behind and, and slightly above your work area, but um, do your research on that because you will kill yourself and possibly your cat and your dog and your kid and your husband and may want to kill him, but you know, be safe. Okay, so what else do we do here? Um, so Amber, uh, ben, you, you want to, shall we move on and somebody yeah. else add something? Yeah. Pick a person. Uh, Chris. Uh, I think, I think Bent knows flyers. Uh, why? I, one of the reasons is, especially when I'm putting jump rings together, um, I can, I can align, I can grab onto the jump ring better with there we go. Thank those. You. Santa. And then I can use my flat nose or my chain nose to properly close my jump ring. Hmm. Um, I find that I use those much more than um, I thought that I would. In fact, they're one of the one of the pliers that I, I go for most often now when I'm doing jump ring stuff. That's so shows um, me the difference between people. I can't stand them, you know. Yeah, and, and you know, a lot of the a lot of the time, it's it's just you. You can buy expensive stuff right away, but I wouldn't spend the top end amount of money until you understand what you're going to be doing procedural was because and, and what you know, you I, the tool to do, you have to understand that, that I think yeah. Big difference. So just a, a cheap set of jewelers pliers from the hobby store to get you started and they're going to break. Don't get me wrong. They're going to break. They're Arrogant. probably not going to be fantastic shape and they maybe last a year or so. I still have some of my original ones from four or five years ago. Yeah, but the gnome pliers are holding up fine. And I believe I bought those from the Joanne Fabrics in Spokane. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> Jewelers um, supply store Joanne's Fabrics. <laughs> I've, I've shopped there too, so I'm not giving crap. Michael's, I don't know, it was one of those. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Uh, oh, there's the bench block. So bench block, just a piece of steel. Um, this one is uh, probably an off brand but it's flat. Uh, a lot of companies have them. Um, but honestly, my first bench block was a piece of railroad. Yeah. Railroad tie. Yeah. I used, I sanded that, polished that and used the crap out of it. I still use it. Um, less for jewelry now, more for uh, getting angry and hitting things with a hammer. But, um, you know, one of the one of the things is that you, you don't necessarily need to go buy this or that or an anvil or you know a hammer. Go go to a secondhand store, look for an old ball peen hammer that you can polish up. Yeah. Um, some of my favorite hammers weren't necessarily uh, 
jewelry hammers to begin with. Um, I bought a lot of mine in a Harbor Freight. Yeah. And refinished the yeah. old the, cobbler's the hammers. The element of learning how to refinish, what do you use to refinish? Start with Sandpaper. Yeah, I, yeah, I know now, but. Yeah, no. I actually have a steel dedicated uh, flat hand file, single cut that I dedicate for steel. And I'll, if it's really messed up, and a lot of the stuff from Harbor Freight is, um, I take the file and first file it down and then go to like 180, 220, 320, 400, you know, all the way up your thing. Up your thing. <laughs> up your thing. Um, the one thing that I would recommend that you probably don't have to pay much money for is a block of wood. Yep. So this happens to be Purple Heart, which is a very, very dense wood that uh, is used for making stakes and other jewelry tools. But this in of itself, you can bore holes in it, use it for shaping. Um, I have stakes and stuff that I made out of it. But just a, a block of dense wood, even a two by four, which isn't that dense, but I use a two by four for forming for many years. And I still use it occasionally when I'm, you know, making something. Yeah. Um, to add to that list, uh, it's, calipers. It's I'm saying it. If you don't use a block of wood, this is what your desk or your bench pen will look like. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you can go get a you know, just a piece of flooring from uh, the hardware store too, like flooring samples. Mm -hmm. Just get that. Um, the other thing, calipers. Yeah. For um, these are very very cheap ones, but they the work. amount of accuracy that you can get out of them for the kind of work that we do is it's great. And the thing is, even if they're slightly off, if you're measuring everything, like your stone is being measured with those, and your metal is being metal with measured with those it ends up netting out to be right anyway you know we're not, we're not even in a competition trying to see how accurate we can get to 1.1 thousandths of a millimeter as long as we're doing it consistently if you don't switch out your calipers those and dividers are another good thing to have oh yeah dividers yeah, yeah. you have your divider um, handy ca ca charity whatever your name is calamity 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 Calamity, that's a new one. I'll take calamity. Usually it's Trinity or Chastity or Cassidy or Harmony or Melody. Those are, those are, yeah, those are fabulous for marking in metal. If you want to do accurate lines like bezel making, I always use those to draw down. Oh, here's a, I got a new gauge. Well, BNS gauge. Those are cool. Some poor taunt. All right, Chris, sorry. <laughs> uh, no, you're fine. And I honestly don't think that it, so, I began, I think, a lot like Nancy and maybe the rest of you did, is that I started working in wire and beads. So there really wasn't a whole lot of reason for me to get into soldering um, to begin with. And I think that, you know, as far as a beginner's kit, you don't necessarily need to get into the torch and the soldering stuff if you're wanting to make jewelry because, you know, a lot of us started off and just beading, beading or wire or, you know, you, this and that. You can do a lot with forging and sawing. Yeah, mm -hmm. cold connect is, you can do a ton yeah. of yeah. rivets, tabs. There's mm -hmm. tons and tons of ways to not have to solder. The only thing that really I found, I finally had to go to torch was for annealing. Like when I was yeah. forming metal, it, it got so work hard and I couldn't bend it anymore. And I was like, okay. And yeah. even then, uh, like a triggered propane torch that you can get from the hardware stores, I still solder with that. I still anneal with that occasionally. Yeah. Um, and the you really have to worry about heat control, but heat you know control. it can be done. First step. Yeah. And if you're going to get one of those propane uh, things, go. Don't get the propane gas. Get the map because the map gas is. Yeah. So it's it, it propane tends to be a bit cleaner. But you're going to be you're going to be uh, cleaning your stuff before you end up working with it anyway. You're not going to I to show you my, my bench block. Do you see how shiny that is? Mm -hmm. That's how I like mine. Um, because whatever's on your block ends up on your metal, especially if you're steel on steel with your metal. Makes right, sense. I That's the one that you show off to everyone you never use, way. right? No, I do too. I, look like, I don't miss very much anymore with my hammers, but my old ones have dents all over. <laughs> This is the new one I just got because I've been using I've been using track anvils like Chris was talking about. 
Uh -huh. um, I got mine custom made from reclaimed track from an Instagram account that's literally called Track Anvils. And that's what I use for Vanish Block forever. But I just got this one from Pepe Tools. I don't know if it'll focus or not. Oh, Probably wow. not. Custom? Yeah, they were doing a thing for a while. They'll, they'll, they'll actually laser your logo on there for you. Wow, can I Check. see the surface of it? Yeah, cool. <laughs> But I just got this, like I didn't have one that big. And my track handles are probably only like two thirds of that width. And I was kind of running into problems with like doing, I do a lot of bangles and stuff. So I kind of needed yeah. some more surface area. Wow. So. so is he, is David still selling those big ones like that? Uh, yeah, he said, they just put a thing up this last week saying that their bench handles got restocked. So yeah, I think they have some more right now. Oh, yeah. Mama might go like shopping. <laughs> Okay, so what else, Chris? You um, are you done? You have more ideas? Um, you know, I think, I think when it comes to what we're talking about, the basic kit, you can go on and on about oh, and this and this and this and this and this. Uh, get creative. Go to the hardware store, buy some dowels, some wood dowels, some different diameters, and use that as a you know a mandrel to begin with. Go to yeah. the hardware store and get you know some stainless steel rod. Yeah. Use that as a mandrel for making bezels or, or something like that. I think eventually, especially if you're going to start soldering, um, I think a ring mandrel, a good quality ring yeah. mandrel is probably yeah. probably right up there with one of the first tools that you should invest in. I used and, to use a can for bracelets, like a yeah. corn, can of corn. Yeah, I mean, it, and you, you can. Yeah. Full. You don't take the stuff out of the can because otherwise it'll collapse. Yeah. But I mean, room. that's the great part of, of, of metal smithing. And, and I think one of the areas that sometimes doesn't get talked about as much is the uh, the ingenuity that goes into us making our own tools sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, not necessarily because there's not something already on the market, but because we don't want to spend the money on what's on the or, market. Or, we need or we're just beginning. Or yeah. we need it right now. Yeah. I did a pinch. Yeah, so I don't know where these came from. It's so weird. I came into my studio today and we had talked yesterday about all the different uses you can do with a nail as a burnisher, a punch, uh, stamps, right? tool, stamps. Yeah. I found these on my desk. Now I did huh. not take them out. How nice. did you get there? Yeah. Sorry, I, I stuck in. out, okay. <laughs> Goes to do pass. <laughs> I got to show you this um, vice I made, and uh, not a vice. I don't know what it's called. The other day, talked about <laughs> necessary. You guys talk without me. Did say you miss pickle pot? Oh yeah, pickle pot. Yep. The old ones have a lid usually that doesn't have that uh, steel rim, which yeah. I find. Oh yeah. Better. For sure. Even a crock crock pot, you That's know, what good, I mean. yeah, Goodwill. I went to Goodwill, found yeah. my pickle pot. I think those ones are better. You shouldn't spend more than ten bucks on them either. That have the yeah. the old seventy sixty ones, you know. <laughs> have the yeah, you don't want the metal rim insert for sure. That's you're gonna have all kinds Bad of times. My, my friend showed me that she gets those. And she actually just gets pliers and like rips the metal rim off. Oh. Somehow without breaking the glass, but she said it fits fine. That's really so, a great idea. I never thought of that. Yeah. So, um, you can really get a crappy great. mug warmer if you're not doing like, um, Sparex or something like if you're going to do citric acid and stuff, you can get like a mug warmer with a mug, even. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That would work. Definitely. Yeah. Like a jar, yeah. like a jar on it. So, this is to turn my flex shaft into like if I have a spinning uh, sanding disc here and I want to come in this way with a, something you know I'm this way so I clamp it to my desk oh this piece of you know it's what do you call it, velcro and a piece of plastic I needed one of these for what I was doing the other day and I could also use it if I hurt my thumb you know, <laughs> stop yeah my hand like it's like taping the knife to your hand on a hostage situation <laughs> I can't drop it <laughs> no, I think you have to be there. Something, huh? 
use it like a little lathe or is that what you were doing? Yeah, yeah. It's just That's like a good a idea. Little lathe. Um, I've, I've done that where I have like another flex shaft holding something over here with wax in particular. I'll clamp one that's stationary and have the other spinning with the wax on a on a post or something that goes yeah and it's good to do it that way because grs sells that whole adapter system but it's so expensive to yeah. get like the flex shaft uh handle holder and all that stuff to make it into a lathe. matt matt uh tools matt wax tools they they have some really nice little kind of lathe things they're um, like delrin right the white the white plastic where you can no. insert the number 30 handpiece into a vice and i don't know they probably have that but i'll show you what i'm talking about uh they're, they're actually steel tools and they're i unfortunately have several that i never hardly ever use because i don't work with wax very often although i love wax carving this is the matte trimmer and your flex shaft goes in <laughs> can i borrow it <laughs> here and then you have a actually you're, yeah, this this is the wrong way yeah, yeah. and then and then it it had this table turns here and then you have a grinding wheel over here and you put your wax on it and this takes the sides off for like rings mm. and then i have the shaper for bracelets which is a similar concept but it's more designed for Ooh, a big one. I've seen those. Yeah. And the blade, the round thing goes in here. And anyway, yeah. they have some really cool tools too for wax carving, but you know, you don't have to have them. Obviously. I, I have a, I, I don't know where it is right now, but one of the old lapidary journals, I would say in the 90s, did a plan like, um, like how to make your own lathe out of wood for your flex shaft. Oh, I, bet I remember you seeing that. Go online and search. <laughs> yeah, you have to, I bet you can find it. The whole uh, layout on how to build it. It might even be on Pinterest. There's a lot of great sites on Pinterest. Oh, right. Yeah. So I want one of my things is I want to talk about the more I've learned about jewelry making, the more I have relied on files. Um, they've become to me extremely important, and uh, these are three different types you guys probably already know this but for anybody who doesn't this is a a, a trademark size called Havilis file uh, made by uh what is it valeron what's her name but, okay so this is a Havilis. so this is between a hand file and a needle file which is this one so here's a needle file and my favorite is an escapement file which look at the difference in the size on these things and one of the deals with um, files is, you know, the smaller they get, the finer, even though it might be a zero, and this is a zero, the cut on these are incredibly different because this is so small, the teeth are finer and stuff like that, you guys. Um, but these, for stone setting, a barrette file uh, with an escapement file, is you can get into these little tiny spots. A barrette file, by the way, has no cutting edge on the back, which is shaped like this. And safe edge safe and then what i do is i polish those safe edges so that when i go in and it hits the other prongs or something it actually polishes them instead of cutting into them so oh. back to finishing your tools but i have lots of files now you know and i keep making lists of i need this and this and this and they're almost all statements but i love these for mid-range work instead yeah. of pulling out a big you know, hand file that's that long. So one of my favorite files, and it's not one that I use very often, but I absolutely love it, is uh, one for um, making hinges. It's just got the rounded over joint file. Yeah, joint files. Really and you don't use them very often, but when you do need one, and you know, I it's a fantastic tool for making basket settings. Yeah, they're, they're great because you could cut your. Um, jump rings. I'll show everybody what I've got a little drawing here. I just did of one. So what these files have is they have the cutting surface on this edge here, and this is all smooth in this area. And they, they come in sizes that are equivalent to wire gauges, the BNS wire gauge. Oh, um, so, so if you're making a groove in like a jump ring that you want a piece of wire to fit up in, 
and you're using 20 gauge wire, you use the um, joint file that's 20 gauge size and that then your wire fun. fits right in there perfectly. They're and fantastic to use. That kind of file. I have something for a list now on my list. No, they're really they're great. Really they're top awesome. charity is they're, they they're, they're addictive bought, when you start buying them because you're like, I, uh -oh. oh, I need an 18, I need a 16. I bought the 16. whole set. Yeah. Just buy the whole set. Because yeah, it you should. It makes a lot of sense. 22, 18, 16, 14, 12, you know. Okay. The same thing, making hinges. You can uh, you can get one that matches the same uh, radius of a tube so that you can insert your, your tube onto your piece of sheet or whatever you're doing so that you have a nice joint for soldering. Auto Fry carries a big supply. Charity. Joint files. Writing it down. Yeah, they're they're pretty all cool. of them. <laughs> yeah, if you're doing any any kind of making your own settings, they really come in handy. Okay, great. Yeah, I'll totally do that. Tell Aaron you got a Christmas list going. Yeah, you're just gonna tell him what to buy. <laughs> yeah, he he doesn't do a he doesn't touch much of anything that has to do with this realm of our lives. He knows that like I know exactly what I want. I'll get it. But he will bring me home pretty crystals and stuff when he goes out on hikes. He knows to bring nice. me rock. Nice. <laughs> well, see what, so what we'll do is we'll just send exact links of what you want. So there you go. It doesn't sure. need to be a surprise. I just get what I want. So I'll just send a link. They'll unwrap it and be like, woo, yay, look, Better yet. surprise. Just give me $1,000 and I'll get back to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. It's the best Christmas ever. <laughs> so, so, Charity, uh, what is your? Did we cover everything? Do you have any additions? Um, I mean, we, we barely. We kind of touched on torch a tiny bit. So, I guess I'll do show and tell for like the first two that I started out with. That's okay. Pretty vandal like today. I'm very proud of you. <laughs> um. So I started out with this creme brulee torch. That's Blazer brand. I did some research, and this seemed to have pretty good reviews. Yeah. And I did read that Blazer brand butane is supposed to be really, really, really clean burning. Um, and so I ended up buying that brand of, of butane to refill it. And I did have friends that bought cheaper butane and they did end up having problems with their torches clogging up and stuff. So there might be some oh. trends to trying to buy nicer fuel. Um, then I found I was doing some bigger projects I needed a little heat and I knew I needed a second torch but I wasn't ready to make the jump yet into I have an acetylene air torch now that's a smith torch um but I bought a blazer one that's a big shot oh so this this works really well yeah um the only thing I don't like about it it is only has one adjustment knob on it and that smaller one has two so this one I have a little bit more variability with what I can do with it this one's kind of like it's like full bore. <laughs> yeah. So this works really good if you have like something up on a tripod and you're trying to heat it from underneath. Like what I'll actually do is set this and leave it on underneath my tripod and then I'll be working from the top with my small one. Oh, okay. Um, right. So I'll like brace it still so it can't fall over or anything. But um, if you're working with like an 18 piece gauge piece of bronze or brass or something. Right. Like, I had like a gauge. huge, like that was cuff, it? That cuff you had on yesterday. Oh yeah. So this is actually, and that's, and this is actually something I made when I took those classes all those years ago. Awesome. So it's brass, thank you, brass and sterling. Mm -hmm. And, um, you don't really need that many tools for this. I needed a saw, right. And I needed something to form this around. We did, we sweat solder all of these birds on, and then we formed it afterward. Yeah. You need files and sandpaper and then yeah. a way to polish it. Yeah. Like, right? Not really that many tools. So um, that's great. With just sandpaper, you don't need to have a tool. Although I do love sanding discs. So, but. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it does make life easier. But um, yeah, I guess that. And then I don't think we talked about um, two things, three things that I use quite a lot. Um, but I have a pair of like flush cutters. Oh, yeah. And they're the Zuron brand. Okay. And I love these. I use these on. so much and they do a great job um, leaving a straight edge for me. Uh, I had bought like traditional cutters to begin with and they just ended up making so much more work in the end. Like, especially if you don't have a way to like make jump rings easily or whatever. I don't know, they're just a pain. Um, and then a scribe. I have two different scribes. I have this one that's like 
traditionally like you know it's got a, a I keep the little rubber tip on it to protect it, right. but I have a scribe. And then this one was cool. Um, this guy named Dave Tarver does all kinds of work, but he actually put out a oh, batch of custom made yeah. scribes in yeah. an antler tip. Oh, hmm. wow. Look at that. That's awesome. Isn't it so cool? I love um, and then tools. <laughs> burnisher, right? Oh yeah. Burnisher. Burnisher setting, setting tools. But, um, Aside from that, um, I'll bring up my, my nerd book talk again, second time's the charm, uh, but safety oh, is about this. <laughs> so uh, we talked about this yesterday in the video that didn't save, so oh, these guys are hearing yeah. it again, but um, this is the Eco Jewelry Handbook, and this has a lot of information in it. We were talking about earlier the importance of good ventilation and all that, but this even goes through and talks about um, different types of solutions you might be using. There are safety and precautions you need to know, and they'll actually go through and do like a safety rating across the board. So if you are someone that's concerned about what you're working with, it's a good tool for that. But they also talk about posture at the bench and things for your body long term. Um, so that's really good. Before you go too far on that, I wanted to mention to people that if you're working with a chemical that you don't know anything about it, there are things called SDS or MSDS, MSDS that you can yeah. find online. Usually the manufacturer or whomever you buy it from will have the information. Read the damn thing. I yes. mean, there are some chemicals that if you breathe them, you will die. So check it out. Okay? Or mix them with something else. Oh, yeah. yeah. It can explode. Mm -hmm. catch yeah. There. I mean, who knew or, it yeah. was flammable? Or need to be neutralized before you put him in, in the yeah, drain in the garbage or whatever. Flammable? Steel wool. Oh yeah. It's really flammable. <laughs> yeah, if you take a nine volt battery and touch it to steel wool, it goes up. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah, I use it in my survival kit. It's a good fire start. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, so yeah, so I mean, it's like our pickle that we use, you know, you've always got to neutralize it. It's an acid, you need to mix it with a base. You need to learn basic chemistry when you're working yeah. chemicals. I think one of the important things to add to the basic supplies for jewelry making is just a Costco sized piece, uh, bag of uh, baking. Um, baking soda. Uh, yeah. Costco, yeah. very good Absolutely. tip. Then you can scoop it in and you- Yeah, I was just doing like, handful. yeah, I'll, I mean, I use it especially when I'm cleaning rocks and I'm cleaning them with muriatic acid. Um, you know, you have to neutralize that before you do anything with it. Which is muriatic um, acid is used in spas mm -hmm. and yeah. swimming pools and yeah. all sorts of fun stuff. Um, of we've talked about flush cutters. I'm going to yeah. see if I can turn you guys around here real fast and look at this. This is the brand I buy from Amazon. Oh. Yeah, Hacko really nice. CHP micro cutter, and the reason why I go with those is that they're not the best quality, but Tiny. most of the time when I need a pair of flush cutters, I can't find them, so I'll buy a set of five or ten cheap ones, and that way, if I need a fresh pair of flush cutters, I have them, and they're relatively inexpensive, and you know, they're, I bought to them me, for Chimera. To they me, they're break though at the when yeah. they, where they connect to, to me flush cutters tend to be one of those consumables um especially if you're buying you know a lot of them um i yeah. do have some that have lasted longer but i've also really dumb when it comes to cutting things sometimes i try and go too thick or that so it's always nice to have an extra pair that's you know fresh and clean yeah, I mean, it's easy to want to push it. Yeah. Well, and if you're cutting steel with them too, you're dulling them. Oh, yeah. yeah. Solder, I don't like using the, the scissors. I prefer using little cutters, and I end up using the flush cutters for that for some reason. Oh, really? So I, there's I a top shears for mine. There's a tip that I came across, and I did a video on, on my YouTube channel for solder cutters. So you know the kind of, it's a square jaw and it kind of yeah. comes down, used oh, for yeah. sheet or whatever. Yeah. I've taken those and drilled a hole in the side of them so that I can insert wire. And that way I can just quickly cut uh, yeah. wire the same, the same width every single time and just what kind I of feed it What I don't like in. about wire is I find that you have to cut such tiny pieces because I'm a proponent of absolutely minimal solder so what yeah. i do is i roll my solder in my rolling mill until it's really thin hmm. but i could 
I mean, I wonder if you could even cut a little slot in there, because I like your idea of being able to control the size of the pallions, you know, that's often that I want to do that. Yeah. I think someone, I, re, I think I saw those, uh, it might have been close to a year ago, I think that someone does sell a plier that is like a wire solder, that is like a similar the cut, mechanic, yeah, cut mechanism. Consistently sized pieces, because I've got the other solder cutter, but I- I'm not sure, I don't own one, so I've never seen like in person, I guess, how, how long. So I'm, I'm working on developing something that Bill told me about, Charity. Yeah. Down he, when he was instructing down in uh, Quartzite, their studio would have a solder cutter, and you'd insert the solder, and it was a rotary. So it would rotary cut the solder to oh, different wow. lengths. And so I'm working on trying to get the. Uh, that sounds dreamy. It's kind of, <laughs> kind, of into the chipper, kind of fun. It's like, <laughs> but it was a hand. It was a hand crank, and you could adjust the uh, the size of the solder that you were you were cutting and. Oh, I'd cool. like to try and make it so that you wouldn't necessarily have to use wire. Like you do what Lancey said and, you know, roll it down to a flat and then be able to just kind of. Well, now I switched to sheet because I realized I was essentially taking my wire and making it sheet wire and I find sheet. <laughs> I like the versatility, though, of flattening it when I need it because I usually don't. I you usually can't yeah. make it a little thicker or really thin. So you do have a little more options. On, you're right about that. You pulled out the the Power Max. Uh, oh, yeah. These are my favorite. I have to do this because they're, the only problem with these is when if you don't make them foo -foo they you can't ever find them because they're this. I'm not, they're black. They yeah, blend in with everything on your. I can I never could find them, so I had to color them. But they're called Power Max, and they're made by uh, Kiba, and they cut. I think it's up to like twelve. Yeah, I think it's 12. And I, I, apparel lasts me forever and ever. And then, <laughs> ah, there goes my desk. I just punched Half priced. And then these Swanstroms are another one. But And the other thing that I use is a lot is a um, sprue cutter. Uh, I end up, you know, for some reason, I always end up with some kind of thick thing I want to cut. Like if I'm going to take really, like, four gauge wire and turn it into a bracelet you know i don't want to sit there with a saw and i'll use the screw cutters so oh i need to buy one of those too I actually don't have screw cutters i know some people just use bolt cutters for cutting off screws but i imagine that's is a screw cutter better than a bolt cutter i i have personally well actually i know what a bolt cutter looks like um there you know, i i think they're small Jewelry tools are designed okay. a certain way for their certain needs. Uh, they right. don't, they are sometimes better than the others that are not specifically designed for us. So I really don't know what that answer is because I've not done a comparison, but that would be an I, I would imagine it's probably better. It's probably kind of like this flush cutter design where like one side's going to cut flat. So if you turn the plier a certain way towards your design, then it's going to cut it more of a flush thing. So you don't have like a yeah, that way left or something on the end there. Yeah. Maybe there yeah. are small uh, bolt cutters or whatever, but I think that the flush cutters, I mean, you could get them tiny, I mean, pretty small. Yeah, and when you want to get in real, especially with wire work or you're weaving wire or something, you really want the, like the little ones that Chris was getting. Yeah. You have a really tiny, tiny flush cutter. You know, this would be um, totally inappropriate for wire work, but for regular metal smithing, it's great. Yeah. A lot of the time, the, one of the reasons I like those is because they have a very defined tip. Yeah. And so I can reach in some place and smooth something down. And that's usually the first thing that goes with them is, is the tip. That's why I consider that particular type of flush cutter a consumable. Yeah. It's because, yeah. you know, they're just, you know, they're not always going to last. And I think I have some of my drawers downstairs that, you know, I probably should throw out, but you know, they'll they'll work for something that's um, outside of the realm of what I should be cutting, because I'm not really trying to get something completely flush with them. Yeah, because most flush cutters have a limit, by the way, people uh, on gauge. So if you push them past their gauge, they can break, or you can ruin the edge on them. So I break them. Or so like making fourteen gauge uh, ring shanks. The Say big, what? The big flush cutters that you have. Uh, the Power Max? Yeah, 14 gauge ring yeah, shape. No problem with 14 gauge at all. Uh, this is really naughty, but I use these on Crazy 8 wire. 
What's crazy eight wire? That's like the eight gauge wire. That's kind of like the profile is kind of like a loaf of bread. Oh, kind of okay. like rounded, but like flat on the top. Do you see those? Wow. Yes, and I've had these for a year and a half. Oh, wow. impressive. I always wear glasses whenever I'm cutting. Don't get me wrong. Right, right. <laughs> I had bought a similar pair by the same brand that were like the really tiny tips, like you guys were talking about. Right. And I was trying to use it on too big of wires. So of course, I ended up breaking that one. Right, but right. these were rated, I think, to a 12 gauge. Yeah, I think paper, we have a camera on paper. <laughs> I think uh, David gave us some. Or no, it was, um, what's his name over at, uh, oh, for God's sake. At A and A? No, it was oh. uh, Kurt at Microtools mm. uh, gave us a pair of those, and they are they they're pretty powerful for something that's not that robust. You know, I was quite surprised at how good they were. Yeah, they've been good. Do you have more to add to this? Um, I was just gonna throw out the whole book thing again. I know. Um, yeah, I won't go yeah. through in detail, but <laughs> just important to stay inspired, and I kind of warned a little bit about getting sucked in too much to getting too much information online because I have personally noticed as someone in the jewelry scene on Instagram seen that there are some like sometimes ideas like get a little bit re regurge and like everybody will catch on to something and there'll be like a theme and then you'll be seeing it along and these are all people that probably follow each other but it just is kind of a way to like be a little bit removed and still get some inspiration so like earlier you know Nancy took her book out that's got like flowers and stuff like that so just encouraging like people that are starting out to like find books that have different stuff in it um this book's great for some step-by-step -step stool even on us uh, stool step-by-step -step. what part is I trying to say step -by -step. stool Cool. That makes no sense. I need for step by step uh, jewelry making, as you can see. <laughs> but there's different projects and stuff in there. Um, and you know, whatever floats your boat. Like I am obsessed. Like I think filigree is super rad. Amazing. Old stuff's cool. Like just pick up books. Like be looking at the thrift shop. Be looking at um, the thrift store. And like we were talking too about uh, that magazine. Like getting that subscription is great to stay inspired, right? Yeah, yeah, Art Jewelry Magazine, so, Art Jewelry Journal. Well, wait, yeah. Art Jewelry Magazine's gone, unfortunately. Um, the that book, that's, what, that's good for technical stuff, right? But yeah, we were talking about the Complete Metal Smith book um, okay. is a great resource to have and uh, covers like literally everything that you would really need, I guess, need to know. Really, it's pretty complete, the Complete you know Metal Smith. I would love to, to offer people, if you guys would write down your favorite books, I could do a Google Doc that we could link to sure on that 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 would i'd appreciate because i was looking like chris and charity you both have completely different books i thought i had a really extensive library and i do it's up there Ooh, and I then like there's also that. more down here but the deal is is you've got both i've never seen that book the jewelry illustration book i haven't seen your eco book i i haven't seen the indian jewelry book so i would love to get turned on to some new books Here's, here's another another yeah. thing that I'll do is so I have this huge collection of PDF files for books. Oh, yeah. I think I gave them to you, didn't I, Nancy? Yeah. Yeah. And most of them are between, there's, I think there's one or two in the 1700s. We got a sticker <laughs> on top left. There's a, a couple 1700s, but most of them are like early 1900s and 1800s books. Some are lapidary, some are jewelry but a lot of them have pictures of, you know, like you talked about yesterday, Amber, that your, some of your favorite period pieces are, um, you know, the older, the kind of Renaissance look. And a lot of those books have, yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of those books have examples of, of that type of work and it's just phenomenal to look at. And, you know, you may not necessarily want to recreate something that you see exactly, but, for me, and I know the rest of you guys, you'll take elements of things that you see and then kind of use and think unconventionally about how to use those elements to create your own piece. Yeah, for sure. That's what you gotta do. I mean, so I've seen a lot of people who will take a class with a teacher and they make the teachers work. They'll, they'll literally copy the project and then yeah. it's like, where's your voice in this? Where's your passion? Where's your vision, you know? Um, I know uh, Lexi Erickson had some problems with that where they were then trying to sell stuff oh, yeah. that she had. Yeah, and, the, and yeah. you know, I have a real weird view on plagiarism. Um, I always figure 
if, especially if you're a teacher, you're going to get copied. And yeah. I always tell students, okay, you need, if you're going to make something that looks just like mine, you need to say where the source was. But if they don't, I've already moved on. I don't, I'm not yeah. making that again. I don't care. I'm going over here tomorrow. I know some people who have made the same thing for literally 35 years. And they're the ones who really get bent out of shape about it because that's all they do. So it depends, you know, in my personal situation, it's not that big a deal, even though it pisses me off. It's not that big a deal because tomorrow I'm doing this. So, yeah, I don't, know. I don't know how you guys feel about that. but I, I'm kind of of the thought that, you know, if somebody's able to take something that I make and make it better than me, then it's my job it's to improve. It's different than copying it, though. Yeah. I mean, outright balls off to the wall copying. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I recommend doing that for practice. Like, I, that's what I used to do is I would find a piece of Tiffany or, you know, reach high. Why not? And try to replicate it, but I never would have sold it. Right. You know, that was yeah. my jewelry. You got to honor the source. And I mean, even with Native American jewelry, I feel like if you're not Native American, I mean, and that's their whole tradition, you got to kind of say it's inspired or da da da. I mean, because I got the copy, exactly. Absolutely. Yeah, there have been some issues, unfortunately, on Etsy um, with some of the bigger overseas productions will look for one of a kind, really unique pieces that are made by someone. And then they'll actually show this picture to all of their workers, right? And be like, I want you to make 80 of these. And so they'll do their best to replicate it. But that's just it is that even if someone buys that piece and they take it home and they try to make a mold of it and like literally cast it and copy it, it doesn't look the same. You lose detail. The artist's hand will always be in there, but it is, it shakes an artist to their core when they feel like something's been robbed from them and like the recognition's not there, right? But right. when you look at it from a level-headed point of view, you're like, number one, it is the highest form of flattery, they say, to have someone copy you, right? And then you know that they didn't do it as well as you. Or like Chris said, if they did it better, you can be like, well, I guess I need to up my game a little bit. <laughs> Learn a lesson, in general. You know, it's hard with the emotions because people that actually care about their art and they're not just doing this for a job. And that's what I think about people that copy, even their teacher stuff, is that this is more of like an occupation thing to them. And they're actually currently lacking a little bit of the creative thing. Yeah. And that's why they, they need that is because they know they want the creative outlet, yet they aren't allowing themselves to be creative. Yeah. They're just like, well, I can copy that thing. And then it's more of a job at that point instead of a passion. I so I think that's that. the people that get more upset or passionate about their work. Yeah, yeah, because you, it's, it's your eyes. You've, you're seeing it through your eyes and someone is taking on your personality essentially and who you are by taking yeah. your design. So that's troublesome. But I think one of the things you said really rings true is that when you don't have your own design language or your own creative language in place properly, you're gonna tend to wanna copy more because you don't have these designs that come easily to you and that's back to what we were talking about before practicing drawing every day yeah. making it looking at all different kinds of art not just jewelry and developing your you literally have to train that brain to think like a jeweler and if you don't spend the time doing that you won't think like a jeweler and design will become very difficult for you so for yep. me that just shows someone is a beginner you know so yeah, one of the class that i teach teach the beginner jewelry class, I do kind of leave it <laughs> open-ended. Uh, I mean, I, I have templates. We'll talk for, about it in a minute, Chris, hold on. No, you're good, I'm just- on, Amber. For the, uh, for the, the sweat soldering so they can cut out shapes and stuff, I'll give them templates, but uh -huh. I need to make that, I don't make them, but I encourage them to kind of come up with their own interpretation of what they want to make instead of having models there. I'll just have an, a fin unfinished pieces of sweat soldering techniques from past classes uh, because I find that it, the half the challenge is finding your own creative self with making something and it's challenging and it's hard to do that but I feel like it's super important to tap into that as soon as possible. And that's where practice comes in. And for me, when I didn't have the vocabulary, 
I'm, I copied other people's work because I wanted to see how they did it and why they did it and try to understand where they were coming from by, in the piece. Um, and it was a really helpful learning tool. I did the same when I was a painter. I copied the masters, you know, and Gauguin and Renoir and those guys. And, you know, I think that's a great tool, but you, obviously you never sell it. And, but I like you pushing the, um, you know, think for yourself concept, you know, let's start right now. <laughs> and if they have trouble, I would give them examples and, you know, and stuff too. It's not yeah. like thrown to the wolves, but I feel like that chant tapping into that part of your brain is just super important. It takes practice too. So yeah. yeah, that's a good point. And it helps when you have an instructor that encourages individualism. So you don't sit down and make everyone make this exact same complicated pendant, right? They're allowed yeah. to all think of a, a think of a complicated pendant that they would like to make. Yeah. That way <laughs> if you're doing like a video, like I've got a couple of videos, project based videos where ideally this the turnout is that they're gonna make this bracelet or this pendant in a similar fashion you know because they're following my directions so you That's want to hope that they use that. different yeah. stones or they use a different kind of right uh, yeah, thing yeah absolutely that kind of yeah. thing so year, we all did the same thing uh oh. but it was the bench jeweler learning how to do fine jewelry and you have to learn how to do measuring and setting it properly and that I mean, that you can't really, that's pretty standard, like you can't. Yeah, it's hard to, you <laughs> yeah, I get that. Yeah. The solitaire yeah. setting. <laughs> yeah. Anytime I ever took a class, I figured, I, A, I would never finish it. B, it would be in my drawer somewhere. And uh, the, the trick with the taking a class is don't worry about a finished product. What you want to do is go home and practice what you just learned because you're going to forget it immediately if you don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Chris, you had a book you were holding up somewhere? Um, so I started looking for inspiration, not necessarily stuff to copy, but uh, I like historic designs like the rest of you guys do. You know, Charity talked about yesterday about how she wanted to take vintage pieces of jewelry and incorporate it. And, excuse me, it's getting a little late. I know, we need to. Yeah. Amber, Amber was talking about how she likes, you know, the Renaissance periods, just that kind of thing, and and how, you know, what we yesterday I think part of our video was talking about what inspires us, and in trying to find things that would inspire me, I started looking on eBay, and I found a bunch of Southers Southerby catalogs. Oh, oh. Um, I bet that's so. I mean, all sorts of stuff in here. Uh, sometimes the fun part was that. They they have the estimated price that it would go for, uh -huh. and then yeah. some people put on there how much it actually did go for. If you get like a used uh, catalog, uh -huh. um, but I found the same thing from Tiffany's. So I have some Tiffany catalogs cool. showing what their, their lines are and how they do their designs, and uh -huh. you know just interesting things that may not necessarily be. Huh. Uh, what is that stone? Do you think? Uh, that looks to be uh, chalcedony. That's let what I look, let, me, let me look. Seventy one. Yeah, uh, eighteen karat gold chalcedony uh, diamond bangle bracelet. I love but, it on the cover. Yeah, but I mean the uh, yeah. the whole idea was, you know, I'm not going to copy Sotheby's. I'm not going to copy Tiffany's. But I see how all these different elements and these stones can work together. Yeah. And then I'm able to take, you know, even if it's just this bracelet right and i look to see how these guys are made and i, I don't want to make the entire bracelet but i want to make something similar and incorporate similar size or similar shaped stones right the inspiration so, it's, it's okay to get inspired by other jewelry or like you know that's good yeah and a lot of the a lot of the time it's i mean this one incorporates a vintage coin uh-huh so yeah. oh, vintage cool vintage gold coin that was uh huh i want to see those earrings again are they what are they gold and diamonds like pave oh God, that's pave. yeah they're they're all pave so i mean you know you're gonna have to you're gonna have to practice your pave but yeah. that one's got turquoise in it um cool. and a lot of the time it's kind of a it's a crapshoot on whatever whatever they have in the auction at the time 
So that's what's nice about buying auction catalogs is that there's a, usually a wide variety of, of things that are going up for, um, you know, estate jewelry. Yeah. And since a lot of us get our inspiration from vintage styles or from, you know, this and that, it's, it's fun to be able to look not all of it's, you know, your kind of thing or my kind of thing, but um, especially when it comes to how to put things together, how to assemble something, mm -hmm. having, having those type of photographs and those pictures and, you know, that type of resource, you know, in your bookshelf is, uh, it can be a valuable thing. I think it teaches you the steps that are required to put something together too. It's like, what do I do first? How, if I do this, then I'm not going to be able to do that, you know? Order I mean, of operations. I've made, yeah, I've made pieces where I've had the setting that was so far down that there was no way in hell I could get any tool in there to wrap, put the bezel over on it, you know, and go, oh, okay, you're in the scrap pile. <laughs> um, so anyway, we're going to end this soon. I just wanted to mention a couple of my things I, I, that I use that I like having. I, I, I use those scalpels a lot mm -hmm. for, for mm -hmm. a variety of things from opening and opening my toolboxes that come in the mail uh, to cutting out patterns to cutting out vinyl for etching. <laughs> love, love a good sharp scalpel. Um, a really fine small screwdriver, flat, flat nose, uh, a lot yeah. of like, like a cut off disc on the flex shaft or some of the other tools, the, the heads on the screws are all flat heads. And they're also great as wedges uh, to pry something open or off. Um, a bench knife with a really sharp edge. Yeah. Once again, it's another kind of wedge thing. I've used the edge of it and tapped it to split something. Like sometimes I super glue metal together to cut two of the same thing at once. Uh, and sometimes I need to split them if I'm going to be piercing one and not the other. And I don't want to burn the pattern off. I'll do that kind of thing. Um, yeah. What else? Did I have anything else in here? French shop shears I love to death. Those are, I use for thin metal and they're kind of like scissors, you know, but they're, they cut, I think they cut up to 20, maybe even, you know, maybe even 18 sometimes. So they're the workhorses. Um, Anybody want to say anything else? I think we kind of went full circle. I think I'm going to have to make this into a separate video because it's so long. <laughs> so it's going to be two questions and then one more. We'll call this one, this video. Uh, one <laughs> start doing four, four model smiths, two questions. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe we should go down to one question. <laughs> one question. One question and then be most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I think it's couch time for me, and I know Chris is yawning already, and we've been on the on here for an hour and a half, so we did good. Yeah, that's good. All for coming. Thank you. Thank you. What's uh What's next time? I don't know. What do you want to do? I don't know. I was going to mention though. I did mention at the end of the last one that isn't recorded that um, if you guys are interested in not necessarily you guys, but anyone watching this, if they're interested in uh, knowing what metalsmiths do in different countries. Take a look at the Lime Punch Forge uh, YouTube channel, and I did uh, basically it was I think it was about a two-hour interview with Ola Shumbumi, and she's a master goldsmith in Nigeria, and it was fantastic just to listen to what she went through to get where she's at now, and the positive influences, and just I mean char charity wash it, just it was, yeah, it was phenomenal. I like that. I only caught like probably half of that live. I couldn't, didn't get on like in time to see the first part of it, but she is quite the impressive person. <laughs> I really yeah. enjoyed it. So that's up on YouTube now. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And she's adorable too. So. Yeah. Yeah. Like you, when she comes to the States to take a class, you like want to, want to have your, your spare bedroom all, all made up for her. Cause I mean, just <laughs> one of those, one of those people that you're like, yeah, we, you'd have a good time. You'd, you'd get yeah. along and laugh a lot. Yeah, at the end, she's like, I'm going to come visit you. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> so sweet. Okay. <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> Done. I can't wait to see it in the interview. I'll have to watch it tomorrow while I'm having my tea. So, um, okay, my, my homework for you guys is the list of your favorite books. Okay. Jewelry-wise, don't get sidetracked. And um, also think of some questions for next time and a time that would work for you all. Done. Will do. All right, time to go scrape off the makeup. <laughs> <laughs>